Do you remember what your first real job was like? For many of us, we knew that God had gifted us to do this job, and we were so excited. This was our calling. But after actually doing the job, that excitement waned a bit. We realized that we were dealing with real life, real people, real challenges. And maybe for some of us, maybe for most of us, our job became one in which we were no longer thriving. We were really just trying to survive. If that story sounds familiar to you, I hope that you will be encouraged today to know that you are not alone. We're starting a brand new book in the Bible today, 2 Timothy. Now, we spent six weeks in 1 Timothy as we unpacked Paul's first letter to his son in the faith, a young pastor named Timothy who had some very difficult challenges to face head on as a young pastor in Ephesus. Timothy apparently followed Paul's advice, but it also seemed that as he did, as he attacked these issues head on, that he may have suffered some adverse responses to those corrections. He, he may have even, as a result of those adverse responses, toned down his preaching just a little bit. The very thing that God had gifted him to do. So let's see what Paul's response to Timothy's, Timothy's reaction was. Let's turn to 2 Timothy. We're going to start in chapter 1. Let's look at verse 3 and 4. It says, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience as my forefathers did when I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Remembering your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. So Paul opens his letter to Timothy with thanksgiving to God for Timothy. Paul is writing this letter from a Roman prison and he's writing it for the final time. Unlike other occasions when he had been in prison and, and he anticipated his release, this was different. Paul believed, he just knew that his life was approaching its end. So what he now anticipates most is a visit from Timothy to Rome. He would be filled with joy at seeing his friend, whom he considered like a son. Now, Paul's reminding Timothy that he serves God just like Timothy and that he can relate to the things that Timothy is going through. Paul is in an actual physical jail. He is actually chained to the walls of a prison, most likely. But Timothy, serving in Ephesus, likely felt like he was in a bit of a prison himself, wanting to boldly proclaim the gospel but completely and totally exhausted at the adversity that he was facing. And I just wonder, as you think about that situation, can, can you relate to that? I mean, you want to serve the Lord where you are, but man, you are tired. Sometimes before you get ready to really encourage someone, you have to remind them of who they are. And that's exactly what Paul is getting ready to do for Timothy. Let's look at verse 5 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Clearly recalling your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois, then in your mother Eunice, and that I am convinced is also in you. So whether or not you have a family heritage of faith, we are all encouraged to think about those that have gone on before us who had a big impact on our relationship with Jesus. That is what Paul is doing for Timothy here. He is calling him to remember those who introduced him to Jesus, who let their light shine for Jesus around Timothy, around us. That's what we're called to consider when we are in that same tough jail-like situation that Timothy found himself in mentally and emotionally and spiritually and that Paul found himself in physically. So Paul is reminding Timothy that the sincere faith that was in his grandmother and in his mom, that same faith lives in him. And once he lays the foundation, reminding Timothy who he is, 
He's ready for a call to action. Let's look at verses six and seven. Therefore, I remind you to keep ablaze the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. Some translations even say, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is in you. I love the way that that reads. So let me ask you something. Have you ever done something for the Lord? Maybe it was helping a neighbor in need or sharing a passage of scripture with someone or opening up your home for a Bible study or even working in the church nursery. And when you did this, that thing, your heart was so full. Every part of you was just praising the Lord for the opportunity to truly worship Him in that unique way. Something inside of you just came alive as you were ministering to somebody else. That is the feeling of using your gift. Now, not every single time, of course, the Lord does not promise that every day that we use our gifts, we are just going to have unicorns and rainbows and this awesome feeling all the time. But the first few times that we use that gift, something sparks inside us. It does. It comes alive when we begin to use our gift. But the thing about the enemy, Satan, is that he doesn't want us to use our gifts. He wants to distract us so that he can disarm us, so that he can defeat us and ultimately prevent us from carrying out that purpose in our life. Because the purpose is not just for us. It is to minister to other people around us to spread the gospel. It doesn't necessarily mean we're missionaries. It means that our life is on mission. And as we carry out, as we walk in those gifts, the gospel is spread. Timothy was in that situation. And one of the biggest distractions is in using our gifts is conflict. Can I get an amen? Maybe it's because the enemy is so good at stirring it up. (laughs) And I, I bet right now you can think of a situation that the enemy has stirred up conflict in your life. And I bet it's related to using your gift in some way. But conflict seems to be where he can distract us, distract us the most. And once we're distracted, it's much easier to convince us to tone down or back off from using those gifts that God's given us. After all, the path of least resistance is much easier to follow. But once we do that, we have to know that there are blessings Not just blessings for other people, although there certainly are, but blessings that are meant for us that we cannot receive because what was once a fire inside of us has been doused with conflict and fear and it's distracted us and made us withdraw and hesitate. But we do not have to stay there. Hallelujah. Paul is reminding Timothy to fan those embers, to keep the fire of faithfulness burning. In Timothy's case, Paul could have been referring to the gift of preaching because we know back in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that that Paul said to Timothy he did in fact have the gift of preaching. But he also could have been referring to the gift of the Holy Spirit that each of us have when we choose to put Jesus in charge of our life. The Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. And that spirit in Timothy, because he had focused on the conflict, may have been quenched. Either way, isn't it good to know that we can rekindle our gift? We can live abundant life on this side of heaven. Paul refers to the laying on of hands, which does not mean that A spiritual gift is passed from one person to the next person, but rather it implied recognition and consent to service of God in Timothy. So Paul's saying, I know, Timothy, that you were gifted by God. I was there when we recognized it, and I was there when we sent you off to use it. That 
You guys, that is why it's so important to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. So we have witnesses around us to know that God has saved us. Jesus has saved us. And we have everything we need from that moment forward to live out our life for Him. We often hear people talk about God not giving us a spirit of fear, referring to physical fears, right? Fear of public speaking or fear of the dark. But Paul is telling Timothy that anything he faces, anything he faces as he walks in the power of the Holy Spirit, even the naysayers, even the people that don't want to hear the truth, that don't want Timothy to use his gift, anything he faces, he can face it boldly because God's not given him a spirit of fear. That's good news for us because he's not given us a spirit of fear either. So when you start speaking up for Jesus and using the gifts that he's given you for his glory, the enemy will very often find ways to make you afraid. But Paul reminds Timothy that fear isn't from God. But these three things are power, the ability to do what God's called you to do, love, the ability to minister effectively and compassionately, and a sound mind, the ability to know how to respond to situations. And fear is not one of those responses. Okay, we have seven more verses to cover, and we got to do it quickly. So let's get to it. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. If Paul is telling Timothy not to be ashamed, chances are Timothy's response to this opposition has not been ideal. He was shying away, backing down, retreating from suffering. And that's a natural response, right? Who among us charges headlong into suffering? (laughs) Not many of us. But it's also a fleshly response, not one led by the Holy Spirit or one that relies on God. Have you ever known exactly what you were supposed to do? A passage of scripture just came alive to you. But when opposition comes, you rely on your own power, You don't want to suffer and you really don't want to look stupid. Unfortunately, that's called being ashamed of the gospel. Instead, we are to lean into it. We are called to boldly proclaim to those around us with our words and most of all our actions. Look, if you're angry or frustrated about what I'm testifying to, take that up with God. We live our life out as a testimony and and we turn to God and we say, listen, I am suffering. (laughs) And to be honest, I'm a little scared because of this word that you've given me. So 100% of this outcome, Lord, is on you. That is relying on the power of God. God didn't expect Timothy to do this on his own and in his own power, he should have been afraid. But he didn't have to rely on his own power, and neither do we. And here is the God we're talking about. Let's listen to verses 9 and 10. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. This has now been made evident through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is a mic drop moment. (laughs) It just is. God has proven himself faithful. And Paul uses the word us because he wants Timothy to know he is right there with him. He is for Timothy. It's so important not to preach at people, but to proclaim the truth right beside them, making sure they know that you are for them, you love them, and you want to encourage them. This is the evidence of the sincere faith that was in Lois and Eunice and now is alive in Timothy. 
and is alive in each of us as well who have trusted Jesus as our Savior. Let's look at chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. For this gospel I was appointed a herald, apostle, and teacher, and that is why I suffer these things. But I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to guard that what has, that has been entrusted to me until that day. Y'all, we've got to know who we are in Christ. First, we need to know whose we are. If you haven't ever actually stopped to say, I need you, Jesus, to be my Savior, that's where it starts. Then, as that relationship grows, the most amazing thing happens. You begin to realize who you are. With this new identity rooted in the King of Kings, not in your education, not in your other relationships, no matter where you started, no matter who your mom and dad are, or what you've done or haven't done, all things are new in your relationship, through your relationship with Jesus. That's the foundation of the most amazing things you will ever experience. Fulfillment and abundant life. That's, that's happening, but it doesn't happen just automatically. The moment you decide to follow Jesus, you choose opposition. That's not a really popular thing to talk about. <laughs> and you may not be appointed a herald. I don't know many people that go around with that on their business cards. You may not be a teacher or a preacher or an apostle, but listen to me. If what you do each day, you do for the glory of God, the enemy is going to work hard to make you suffer for it, to make you ashamed of it so that you will close your mouth about your Savior to make you think that he is not trustworthy. Can you, like the Apostle Paul, say that even if you suffer, you're not ashamed because you know? Are you persuaded that he is able to guard those things that you hold so dear, those things that he's entrusted to you until the day he returns? Paul's faith wasn't a set of principles. It wasn't religion. Paul's faith was based on the living, breathing, active person of Jesus Christ in whom he had constant fellowship and in whom we can have constant fellowship as well. Let's look at the last two verses, verse 13 and 14. Hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who lives in us that good thing entrusted to you. In other words, you're well equipped with theological truth, practical experience. Now, access the Holy Spirit. Remember to fan those flames. Guard the good thing entrusted to you, the gospel. Use what you've been given to make Jesus known to others. Don't be ashamed or scared or intimidated. That's not from God. You have a mission field right where you are. The outcome is not yours but faithfulness is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Holy Spirit who is our teacher. Thank you that we have all we need in you. Let us fan the flames of the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit that has lived in us from the day we trusted you. Thank you for gifting us uniquely and let us not be afraid to use what you have given us fully. We have victory in us, Lord, because of Jesus. Now you have victory through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week on Truth by Light.